So this is my new toy, my Nikon F3. This was the top uh, Nikon professional manual focus 35mm camera from uh, its introduction in 1980 to its eventual discontinu uh, discontinuation about the year 2000, which is a long time, although it was replaced as the top Nikon professional camera by the um, autofocus F4 in, I think, 1988. I've always wanted one of these since I was very young and first started getting interested in photography. And even though it's somewhat older than I am, it's, it's inter the reason I sort of fixated on this one is because I used to have these, or I still have these books about photography, which um, such as this one, which is by, by um, Michael Freeman, and this one, which is also by Michael Freeman, has some, has some other ones, but these are. Um, good examples, and in these books, the uh, the F3 is very often the example of a professional camera that is used. So I'm sure this influenced me to some degree. Yeah, there is the Nikon F3 in um, in use with a I think that's a 105 millimeter lens, and that I think is a titanium version of the Nikon F3. So I got this um, just last week off the internet from the dealer, the English dealer Mythsuds, which is based in Devon, I think, and it cost me um, £199 for an F3HP um, in so-called excellent plus condition, which is um, okay condition, it's fully working. It didn't come with a lens, that's another lens that I bought recently. So it's still not as cheap as some film cameras are these days because it uh, seems to hold its value relatively well. So this is an introduction to the camera's features. Now it's in the standard manual focus 35mm configuration and it has the film wind lever, the rewind knob on this side and the uh, shutter speed dial. Obviously on this kind of camera the aperture is set on the lens, that's uh, something that people are more familiar with modern uh, autofocus film and digital cameras everyone might not be familiar with. So I'm going to start talking about the lens mount, which is where you attach the lenses. It's a standard Nikon F mount with AIS. AIS is the method of telling the camera the film's aperture and that is done with this little tab which the lens engages with as you attach it. So you have the lens, it's on there, and when you turn it, the tab turns with the aperture, and that's how the camera knows the aperture setting. This camera has the ability to use pre-AIS lenses, which didn't have that tab, where you press in this small um, button here, and that flips up out of the way. However, when you use a pre-AI lens, you have to use um, stop down metering, um, where you press the depth of field preview button before you take the exposure. This is the depth of field preview button. When you press it, the uh, lens will stop down to the taking aperture so you can preview through the eyepiece the, um, the depth of field. This lever is the mirror lockup. You can see the mirror inside there. This, If you press down the depth of field lever and throw that, that flips the mirror up. Now there are several reasons why you want to do that. This reduces the vibration when a picture is taken um, on a tripod for example. So if you're using um, a tripod and you have a very sensitive shutter speed used, several um, shutter speeds are more prone to this mirror slap effect than others. Something like 2 50th of a second I think will have the effect of mirror slap. So once you frame the picture Sometimes you can um, flip up the mirror, even though you won't be able to see through the, um, the viewfinder anymore, you'll have much less vibration, because you only have the actual shutter moving and not the whole mirror flipping up and down each time. Obviously, um, that's only for static subjects. You couldn't really use that with a long lens if you're taking pictures of birds, for instance, although nowadays you'd probably be using an autofocus camera for that. The other reason you might want to use the mirror up is when you are taking um, pictures with a old-fashioned type fisheye lens which uh, has a protrusion at the back the rear elements stick much further out into the 
um, camera and will foul the mirror if it's present. So switch lenses require the mirror to be locked up. The mirror is flips back um, by moving the lever back. Now the mirror itself, you can see, um, has a sort of change in, in colour on part of it and that's because it is um, partly silvered in the middle, it has many small pinholes in the silver which means some of the light travels through the mirror um, hits another small mirror at the back and directs the light into the um, photo, uh, the light sensitive um, photodiode which is in the bottom of the mirror box this is the first camera Nikon made that had that feature previous um, Nikon professional cameras like the F2 when they had a, a meter, had the meter in the uh, viewfinder prism box, so that's a that's a difference. The other tab here uh, is a um, a manual release lever. This uh, F3 was the first Nikon professional camera to have an electronic shutter rather than a fully manual mechanical shutter as used on the F and the F2, which means that the um, shutter won't work if there's no power to the camera. However. Uh, even if there are no batteries installed, this manual release uh, will work. You throw it by turning it anti-clockwise and that will give you one shutter speed which is something like a 60th of a second um, which is limited but better than nothing and the button in the centre is the exposure lock button. This is the uh, self-timer um, flashing LED, this is the lens release and this is the PC, uh, PC socket. So this is the, the top plate of the camera where the control, most of the controls are housed. This is the multiple exposure lever where you can set um, the lens not to advance when you um, cock the shutter with the um, wind mechanism. And this is for doing multiple exposures um, if you want to do those kind of effects. For instance, if you had a black background, you could take pictures of a, a moving object which would freeze it at several different frames, sort of like a, a strobe effect. Uh, this is obviously the film counter, this resets when you open it up. This is the wind advance lever, which you turn like that. Obviously it has a standoff position and then a full wind position. This is the on switch, which you turn, it's concentric with the shutter button, which is uh, the um, standard way of uh, Nikon on switches, so it's really quick to the finger when you want to turn on the camera. And this is the shutter release button, which is threaded for a, um, a plunger uh, remote release. And that's the shown the shutter makes. You can also advance the film into the steps with a ratchet if there is a, a limited room for any reason. This is the uh, shutter speed dial, and you can select um, any shutter speed from 8 seconds to 1 2,000th of a second by simply pressing the button and turning it. The uh, flash speed is marked here as 1 60th of a second. This is the um, fastest speed you can use with the flash because obviously the shutter doesn't reveal the whole film at any greater speed. Actually, it's a slit which travels across the, uh, the film at faster speeds to give you a, a shorter exposure time even if the shutter itself isn't moving any faster. Um, there are also other settings which are X which is the um, X-Sync for flash, which is slightly faster than 60th of a second, it's an 80th of a second. T-Mode, which is um, a type of time exposure where you, uh, when you press the shutter and release it, the camera will take it, start taking a picture, the shutter will open and it will stay open until you move the shutter speed dial again and that will shut the mirror, it's called time exposure and B which is a bulb exposure, named for the old fashioned uh, squeezing bulb you would use to press down the shutter and this will stay, keep the shutter open for as long as you hold down the shutter. So with this you can do exposures as many length of time greater than 8 seconds but obviously uh, using film you have to be careful that the um, reciprocity, I think that's how you say it, the uh, linear na nature of the exposure um, regularity of film will break down at longer exposures or very very brief exposures which means you will need a conversion table to work out the actual um, exposure time you'll need um, which will be different from what you'd expect from just looking at um, the exposure value. A is aperture priority mode, I think it's described in the manual as auto mode but it's aperture priority, this is the first Nikon professional series camera that had aperture priority so in this setting it will uh, choose whichever shutter speed it is required 
um, based on what the um, lens aperture setting is, which it detects with the AIS coupling. It will, uh, I believe, use uh, a stepless shutter speed, so it will use whatever shutter speed is required, um, but it will indicate in the viewfinder the nearest step. This is the self-timer lever, which is a bit stiff on this camera. In the uh, red dot mode, when you switch it on and take a picture, it will wait. It has a 10 second waiting time. This is the exposure compensation dial. You hold down this um, switch and then you move the dial around it to select between plus and minus two stops. Closer related to that is the ISO um, or ASA number selector here. This, isn't, this hasn't got DX so you have to remember to set it. And obviously um, you can also use this for exposure compensation as well. This is a manual rewind for the film, which you uh, obviously when the um, roll is complete you need to turn it over, press this button on the base to release the mechanism, and then you can start turning this uh, to rewind the film. I think it goes this way. What this is, is the hot shoe. It has an unconventional um, design of hot shoe, it doesn't have a standard kind, because um, this uh, has no uh, facility for a hot shoe on the top. Only the um, F4 had that. However, there were, I think, a special, two special versions of the Nikon F3 which did have a, um, a standard hot shoe here. Although it didn't allow for TTL flash. This does have TTL flash if you use the special flash, uh, Nikon flash, which has this um, proprietary hot shoe. Uh, uh, if you use a standard adapter, which I have, you cannot use. Um, the TTL mode, you have to use the auto mode, however I think more recently, I think even after the Nikon, uh, F3, Nikon F3 had gone out of production, Nikon introduced a, an adapter which allowed you to use um, a standard Nikon TTL flash with the F3. It had a large sort of um, module which clicked onto there and had a standard Nikon TTL hot shoe. Okay, so to open the back you hold down this catch here and pull up the film wind knob will pop open the back and you can see the shutter. This is a horizontally travelling shutter. You can see most modern shutters are vertically travelling and have a, um, a leaf. We have a multi-part shutter. This is a titanium shutter um, made of two parts of titanium um, film. Modern shutters use a vertical travel because it's a shorter distance vertically which means it can, it can be faster basically. So if we want to take a picture, we'll hopefully see if the um, camera will detect the speed. So we'll set it to one six, one eightieth of a second and take the picture. See if the film camera will pick that up. This is where the film cassette goes in here. We'll engage with the sprocket here, which is made of metal. And this is the um, film take-up spool here, and this is the uh, sprocket. Um, engager here which synchronizes the um, frame counter. These two contacts are for a data back which can implant and um, imprint the time and the date and other information onto um, the film as you take the picture. And this is the back which has a, um, a film pressure plate to keep the film level and um, a small roller here to assist that. This is removable holding down this catch and taking it out thus and in, and with this you can replace it with the data back. This has on the back a, uh, a small sort of window in which you can put the tab of the film box to remind you what film is in. You reattach it by holding down that catch. In. This is the, the bottom plate of the camera. I've already told you the film rewind selector. This is the tripod mount, this is the battery chamber which goes off. Now this camera has a um, motor drive attachment called Nikon MD4 which will attach by screwing into the tripod collar and engaging with um, this uh, hole here. You also unscrew this um, cover which reveals the electric contacts which allow the camera to communicate with the motor drive. And this small um, sprocket here is what it uses to uh, advance the film. I think that allows up to six frames a second. This is a serial number. 
Now, according to the internet, this camera was manufactured in about 1984, which means it's older than I am. Now, one of the particular features of um, top end professional manual SLR cameras and some autofocus ones, such as the Nikon F4 and F5, is that the top, um, the mirror box, the viewfinder prism is removable. So you can take it off by holding these catches and take it off such as that. And you can see that this reveals the focusing screen beneath, and you can see the prism inside which uh, transmits the light to your eye. Now, there are several different um, prisms available, viewfinders available for the F3. There is a standard prism, and there is the HP or high eye point prism. This is the HP, the high eye point prism, which is isolated because this makes it slightly easier to use glasses because your eye doesn't have to be quite so close to the viewfinder uh, to see the whole of the focusing screen. So, if you remove the prism, you can see the uh, focusing screen. So you can use the camera without the um, prism, however, light will get in more easily and it will um, mean the exposure will be wrong because light falls through the prism into the, into the um, photodiode which is at the bottom, so you would be advised to cover your um, hand if you wanted to use it like this, use it in a dark area. The other viewfinders that are available are a um, Hasselblad style um, sort of uh, fold up uh, viewfinder cover which doesn't really have any uh, prism in it, it's just a sort of uh, set of flaps which fold up and you can see into the um, focus screen directly and it does have the flip up magnifier I think. There's also a magnifier um, finder which um, fits on, doesn't have a prism but it does have optics to uh, view directly onto the uh, focusing screen and there's also an action finder which is a, a sort of enlarged prism which allows you to have um, a, a very wide view of the focusing screen for instance if you're using goggles or other kind of um, uh, face wear which would mean that you were not so, e uh, not so um, close to the viewfinder and that would be usable for for instance um, action photography that's called an, an action finder. Not only is the viewfinder removable the focusing screen is also removable. This is the standard uh, viewfinder which comes with the camera and it has a, um, a small prism in the middle which uh, assists in focusing, acts as a sort of um, range finder type um, focusing aid where you turn the camera the two halves of the image will come into uh, into alignment which means it's focused. It also has some tiny micro prisms ground into it in the circle around. These also um, appear fuzzy when the image is not focused and around that is a standard sort of ground glass with a Fresnel lens which is, uh, ensures you have an even um, image when you focus the camera. So this is the standard screen which come comes with the camera, you can see the mirror inside there, and this pops back in there. It does a sort of spring loaded setting to make sure it stays in the right position. Other screens were available, um, such as the E screen, which had um, grid lines etched into it um, to ensure that you had a vertical uh, horizon, or vertical lines or horizontal horizon. Uh, most modern cameras have those available on demand via LCDs in the viewfinder. There are also plain focusing screens or other focusing screens which were suited to longer lenses um, with which the viewfinder um, rangefinder prism won't work properly. And there's a whole um, set of about 20, I think, for different purposes, including one which had the ratio of a television screen on it because these kind of cameras were often used for things like doing the um, titles of um, television programs or films <clears throat> by taking pictures with very high contrast film. So this camera has in the viewfinder uh, several um, displays in addition to the focusing screen which are here. There is a small um, window which um, allows you to see the aperture um, of the lens 
it's just a window you can, which looks down onto the aperture of the lens, so if it's dark you can't really see the aperture of the lens. And there's a small LCD here which reads off the shutter speed selected, and there's an LED here which um, is a flash ready light which will light up with the um, uh, light um, that flash, um, flash if the uh, flash is a Nikon um, dedicated flash. There's a small um, light here. If I reattach the prism, you'll be able to see it in action. The light is there for low light conditions. So you switch from the camera, hold down the um, shutter to activate it and press this button. A small uh, light bulb will actually light up and illuminate the aperture um, dial so you can see which aperture is being used and it will also illuminate the LCD inside. In terms of metering, this has an old-fashioned centre-weighted meter, which is where the sensitivity of the uh, light meter is concentrated in the centre of the uh, viewfinder. This is uh, not used in more modern cameras, which use um, more uh, advanced so-called matrix metering or evaluated metering, depending on the make, but that breaks down the um, image into different areas, which the camera then, with the microprocessor, detects which is the brightest and which are the darkest areas of the image and sets the uh, exposure accordingly, which means that the photographer has to do much less thinking about what exposure uh, they should use given the particular range of um, brightness in the, in the image. If your brightest um, part of your image is your cent is the subject in the center, which may or may not make for a pleasing composition. The center weighted meter will expose accordingly. However, if your brightest subject is off center, you will have to uh, take care as you take the exposure to make sure that you, have, um, you are using the proper exposure for your subject, which may or may not be in the center of the image. Uh, this has a 80% concentration in the center of the, the circle in the middle of the viewfinder which is more than most Nikon cameras which have center weighted meters they tend to have 60-40 so they have 60% of the uh, sensitivity concentrated in the, in the center which uh, means that you are less biased towards the center of the uh, viewfinder. Now the reason this is on a professional camera has a, this more concentration is that uh, Professional photographers are expected to be able to uh, recompose and know which is the um, which is the expo which is the area of the image they want to set the correct exposure for. Now a word on lens compatibility. Now this was designed for AIS lenses, which is um, the 55 mm macro I'm using to film this, or this rather dilapidated um, 24mm f2.8 AIS. Uh, you can tell it's an um, AI or an AIS lens because it has this tab here. AIS lenses have the addition of this small cutout here and an orange um, minimum aperture number. However, uh, it doesn't matter to the f3 if it's an AI or an AIS lens, that would only matter to the cameras such as the uh, FA which has the first matrix metering um, adaptation that Nikon had. However, the advantages of using a, an AIS lens are not as great as some people think. Um, you can still use program mode in those cameras with a standard AI lens rather than AIS lens. So these, um, these lenses are what the camera is designed for and these obviously work perfectly in any mode. Now, you can also use all the Nikon AF lenses, such as the um, 180mm f2.8 which are also AIS lenses. You can see that it has the orange minimum um, aperture mode here and it has the cutout in the lens mount. This mounts thus. You move the aperture to set the aperture and some lenses such as this one have a, a manual focus to autofocus switch which means that you have a a nicer manual focus um, feel when you're using it in manual mode, which is just right with this camera. This works as if it was the 
uh, I guess the version of this lens it isn't quite as well made as that version. Uh, more recent AI, um, AF lenses made in the last 10 or 15 years tend to have um, G uh, type lenses which means they have no aperture ring which means this camera can't really work with them. It will always use the minimum aperture. They will mount onto there quite happily but and you'll be able to see through um, the lens quite well but the camera will think that you are using the minimum aperture setting at all times um, or rather it will think that you are not using the minimum aperture setting at all times but when you take the picture it will set the lens to the minimum aperture so it will think you want to take the picture at f 3.5 uh, and will expose for an f3.5 picture however when you take the picture it will stop down to the minimum aperture of f22 um, or f32 whatever it happens to be and your picture will be horrendously underexposed you could use it in manual mode I suppose um, knowing the minimum aperture but obviously you will be taking it at the minimum aperture which means you will have to use a very slow shutter speed and um, it will perhaps have a lower image quality due to diffraction